Hi guys, uh, my name is Charles Kuntz and I'm one of the surgeons at Southpaw. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting since we had recently done a total ear canal ablation um, that you might want to see a lecture um, on surgery of the ear canal and I'm going to review some of the anatomy, indications for surgery, um, the uh, types of surgery that we can do, uh, diagnostic imaging and results of those surgery. And so uh, if you'd like to join in, that would be great. Uh, as always, we've got the um, chat uh, uh, going on uh, like we always do. And uh, so if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to um, post them and I'll answer them as soon as I can. So I'll just switch back to the picture in picture um, so you can see my iPad uh, and we'll get started straight away. So. Um, with regard to surgery of the ear, um, first thing we ought to consider um, is the anatomy. And there's a lot of really important anatomy um, surrounding the ear. And most of the things that can go wrong when you do a total ear canal ablation relate to um, two important pieces of anatomy that are nearby. And so I'm just going to switch over uh, to my drawing app. And please excuse my uh, poor... Uh, artistic technique, um, but I'll do my best and see if we can get through the, uh, some of the relevant anatomy. So um, this is our patient here, big uh, black shiny nose uh, is here. Now we have the pinna uh, reflected dorsally and we have the external uh, opening to the ear canal right here the vertical ear canal right there, and then it curls around into the horizontal ear canal, and we have the tympanic membrane sitting right here, and then we have the tympanic bulla right here. Now, as far as um, vasculature in the area, we have the jugular vein uh, coming up from the neck here, and then it bifurcates into the lingual facial vein and the maxillary vein right here, and then we have uh, the mandibular salivary gland sitting right here, and then, uh, and that's the, uh, and then we have the sublingual salivary gland, uh, polystomatic and monostomatic portions right here, and that goes underneath the digastricus muscle, which is sitting right here. Um, now, really important bit of anatomy that we see in the area um, is going to be the facial nerve, which comes out of the um, stylomastoid foramen right here and then branches. And you can see its proximity to the external ear canal, um, which makes it uh, very much at risk when you're doing total ear canal uh, ablation surgery. So I'm gonna turn this around and um, look at the anatomy from a different direction. Um, and so if we're looking from the front of the dog, we have the external ear canal sitting here, or external opening. We have vertical ear canal coming around the angle to the horizontal ear canal. We have the tympanic membrane sitting here. And then we have the tympanic bulla sitting right here. And the facial nerve comes out of the stylomastoid frame and, and, uh, and branches around like that. And so again, it's gonna be in very close proximity to the ear canal when we're doing an ablation surgery. Now, um, we have the semicircular canals sitting right here. And so that's what's responsible for uh, our vestibular signs when we explore uh, too far dorsally during our total ear canal ablation surgery. And then we have the cochlea sitting right here, which is of less importance because we assume that a lot of these dogs are gonna be deaf going into the surgery and so there's kind of an expectation that they're going to be um, deaf afterwards. And the literature is out uh, as to whether um, they're deaf or not after the surgery. And there are two studies that came out both in the early 90s that uh, one of them showed that these dogs did retain hearing after the surgery and one of them showed that they did not retain um, hearing after the surgery. So, um, and then you do have the sympathetic trunk that's riding right in the middle um, of the tympanic bulla. And, um, and so some of these dogs are going to get uh, Horner syndrome after the surgery. 
And then the other important structure is that we have a branch of the internal carotid, which is Roshro here. So it's sitting kind of in this vicinity right here. And that's responsible for a lot of the hemorrhage that we see after this procedure. So just to review, we've got the jugular vein breaking up into the maxillary and linguofacial veins. You have the parotid or the um, mandibular salivary gland here. You actually have the parotid salivary gland that's kind of encircling um, the uh, external ear canal around the tympanic bulla here. And that can be damaged sometimes when you do the surgery, but I've never seen a dog develop a salivary mucus seal in that region. Um, we've got the facial nerve again coming out of the stylomastoid frame in here. Um, and uh, the internal carotid artery sitting uh, right in this vicinity right here. Um, the facial nerve does come out and branch into palpebral branches. And that's probably the most important branch that uh, is relevant to clinical signs after we do the surgery and that some of the dogs, probably about 10% um, of dogs are gonna have permanent facial nerve palsy after a total ear canal ablation. And those dogs are gonna be demonstrating signs of an inability to blink. Uh, Truth be told, most dogs, uh, particularly dogs that are not brachycephalic with big bulbous eyes, um, are not going to have to have chronic administration of eye medications or anything, um, even if they do have facial nerve palsy. So let's get back to um, our uh, lecture review. So indications for surgery. So the main indication for surgery um, in dogs with uh, otitis externa is recurrent otitis, which is refractory to medical management. So you've tried appropriate antibiotic therapy, um, managed all the skin disease, and they still continue to have otitis externa. And some more definitive problems, if you have an anatomic um, stenosis of the ear canal, if you have a lot of polyps, if you have a lot of hyperplastic tissue, if you have neoplasia, um, those are the most common causes for uh, um, anatomic abnormalities that are, that are going to restrict drainage um, and restrict access for medications to the ear canal and they're going to require um, a total or a, uh, some kind of ear canal surgery. As far as diagnostics that we can do in dogs that have otitis externa that we're considering doing uh, ear canal surgery, um, otoscopic examination is a, is a really good idea and this is a, um, a very impressive um, uh, otoscopic examination of a normal tymp tympanic membrane. So we can see the auditory ossicle um, sitting uh, on the other side of the tympanic membrane. And that normal tympanic membrane is going to be almost completely translucent. And you can see into the tympanic bulla um, on a normal patient. This is in contrast to a dog that has a mass inside the ear canal. And, and the masses that we commonly see in the ear canal would be a polyp, might be a ceruminous gland adenocarcinoma, might be a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, those are the ones that we commonly see. And there is a big difference in the outcome with dogs with those different types of tumors. Um, and I'll review that a little bit later on, but ceruminous gland adenocarcinoma can almost be uh, 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 guaranteed a cure with a total ear canal ablation in many cases, whereas a squamous cell carcinoma tends to be a lot more invasive and can go into the bone, uh, invade into the tympanic bulla, through the ear canal, um, all sorts of things. And so if I, and grossly, they're gonna look a lot more ulcerated than a ceruminous gland endocarcinoma. Uh, you can do conventional radiography. And on conventional radiography, what we're looking for is cloudiness of um, one of the tympanic bullas. And so I'm not sure that I can point um, on um, my iPad. Um, I don't believe that I can. Um, but you can see that on the right side of this patient that there is cloudiness in the tympanic bulla, whereas on the left side, it's completely clear and the bulla is very, very thin and air-filled. And so that's, um, uh, that's what a normal tympanic bulla should look like. So uh, CT scan is really, really helpful in these dogs. And we do them particularly in patients that were concerned about neoplasia. And so on the left side of the picture here, we can see that that tympanic uh, bulla is completely full of soft tissue. And that's in contrast to the contralateral side where it's full of air like it's supposed to be. Now, if you look just dorsal to the tympanic bulla, you can see kind of a spiral and that is the cochlea. Um, so that's where all of the sensory fibers that are responsible for hearing are located. Uh, here's another CT scan where uh, not only can we see on the right-hand side of the screen, we can see um, that we've got an air-filled bulla and an air-filled ear canal. And if we go over to the left side of the screen, we can see 
that the ear canal is completely fluid filled as is the tympanic bulla and the uh, bulla is very thickened as well. And so um, that is a sign of chronic ear canal disease. And I believe that this dog actually had complete stricture or stenosis at the junction between the horizontal and vertical ear canals. Uh, this is another patient that had on the right hand, on the left hand side, we can see a normal tympanic bulla with a normal air, air filled ear canal, horizontal ear canal, a normal air filled tympanic bulla. And then on the left, uh, on the right hand side of the screen, we can see that that is completely calcified. Um, and there's even a calcification going through uh, the entire tympanic bulla. The ear canal is completely obliterated um, uh, by soft tissue. And this is just kind of a, a cool three dimensional volume rendering. Um, this is uh, a volume rendering where we've made all air spaces show up in pink. And so you can see the vertical ear canal coming over to the horizontal ear canal, and then you can see the tympanic bulla. And interestingly, you can see a little ridge within the tympanic bulla, which separates the dorsal lateral and ventral medial uh, sections of the, uh, of the tympanic bulla. Really important to note that in cats, there's actually a bony septum between the two. And so if you're doing a total ear canal ablation in a cat, you have to make sure that you go into both the dorsal lateral and the ventral medial compartments. So we'll come back over to the beginning here. Um, lateral ear resection is a uh, ear canal surgery that's commonly done and it's, it's gone, done frequently in primary care practice because it's usually a fairly straightforward procedure, um, doesn't require a lot of special equipment. So indications for lateral ear uh, resection um, would be if we're trying to uh, biopsy or remove benign polyps, so we need better access to that horizontal ear canal. And so just gonna come back over to um, my drawing here. Um, so if, let me just get rid of this and we'll start a new one. If you have the external ear canal sitting here with the pinna up here, you have the vertical ear canal coming around to the horizontal ear canal. And say you had a polyp sitting in this location right here and you're struggling to access, access it for biopsy or for removal, then you could do a lateral ear resection. And what that involves is excising the, or, or making two vertical incisions um, into the lateral wall of the vertical ear canal and then folding that downward. And so what we're gonna have left is a uh, normal ear canal sitting here or the, the medial aspect of the ear canal. And then that's going to, the lateral uh, section is going to be folded out laterally like this. And we've got our opening to the ear canal, the, the horizontal ear canal sitting here. And then this is going to be sutured to the skin as a drain board like this. And then this is um, the normal ear canal. And then we're gonna suture that as well which uh, is gonna be skin sutured to the internal skin of the vertical ear canal like this. And then that's gonna allow us access to the vertical ear canal. So coming back um, here, so biopsy removal of benign polyps, or you can try to ameliorate um, otitis externa, but note that in only the mildest of cases is a lateral ear resection going to be effective. Um, and um, uh, we, you know, it's, it's a successful in probably about 45% of cases that's in contrast to a total ear canal ablation, which is successful in about, um, 95% of cases. So we'll come back here to the actual procedure. And I already drew you a little picture of that, but what we're doing is we're making two incisions in the, um, vertical ear canal and we're folding down that cartilage to make a drain board. Um, and so... Um, this is what the procedure looks like down here. So we've opened that up um, and we've got a new hole uh, sitting there that we can see into the horizontal ear canal and we've sutured that drain board down. And so I'll come back over to my drawing, um, which shows effectively the same thing. Um, obviously not as high quality because I'm not a very good artist, but um, so there's the ear canal uh, sitting there. Uh, and then the sutures here, which are suturing the skin of the ear canal over to the skin of the side of the face.
So, and then the other surgery that we're going to talk about is the total ear canal ablation. Now, total ear canal ablation is kind of your standard uh, specialist surgery. Uh, and the, the benefit of a total ear canal ablation is that it's much more successful when we're treating ear canal disease. So indications for total ear canal ablation, um, again, if you have otitis externa that's refractory to medical management, um, if you have calcification of the ear canal, and so that's a sign of very chronic inflammation, um, if you have neoplasia of the ear canal, um, and if you have stenosis of the ear canal. And then going back to neoplasia of the ear canal, we have two different types. We have seruminous gland adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, and these are very different when it comes to prognosis. Seruminous gland adenocarcinoma, again, can be fairly consistently cured with a total ear canal ablation, median survival time of about four years. That's in contrast to a squamous cell carcinoma, which has a median survival time of only about a year, even with a total ear canal ablation, and that's because of recurrent disease. Neither of these have any tendency to metastasize other places in the body when it occurs in the ear canal, but um, seruminous gland adenocarcinoma is much more likely to be localized in the ear canal so that when you do a total ear canal ablation, you can get rid of the entire tumor. Squamous cell carcinoma, again, tends to be much more invasive into the surrounding tissues. So as far as the procedure is concerned, uh, what we are doing is this is the ultimately what they, uh, what they look like. So we've removed the entire ear canal and we've gone down and done a bullet osteotomy. Uh, and uh, so I uh, recently posted a, a video in its entirety of a whole total ear canal ablation and you can go back to that. Um, and I'll put a link to that video on the chat um, but you can review that, and, um, and I also do a fairly in-depth description of what I'm doing at the time. Um, so here we're dissecting, and when we dissect, we want to make sure that we get around all of the uh, hyperplastic tissue, or if you leave hyperplastic, hyperplastic tissue in the ear, uh, even though you're doing a total ear canal ablation, you're still going to have residual dermatitis within those folds of tissue. Um, so again, this is the incision around the external ear canal, made an incision down the vertical ear canal. Um, and then we're basically starting to peel out the, um, uh, the vertical ear canal down to the horizontal ear canal. Now it's really critical that we're very, very careful with our dissection because there is a great risk for facial nerve injury um, when we're doing this procedure. Uh, so this is as we're getting deeper and deeper into the ear canal, this happens to be a cat and you can do total ear canal ablations in cats commonly. Um, so this is as we've gotten uh, further dissection um, of the ear canal, and this is quite a thickened ear canal, and we've got a lot of calcification um, of the ear canal, which is contributing and a symptom of the chronic ear canal disease. Um, so further dissection here, and um, all the way down uh, to the bulla here. And on this picture, uh, you can see that little white stripe uh, in the corner close to the gelpie, and that is, um, I think that's pooled blood, but that's exactly where the facial nerve is going to be. Uh, so now this is the view that we have looking down into the tympanic bulla. And this is what they look like post-operatively. Um, here's another picture. So we closed, uh, closed this basically into a T, um, uh, a T incision. So, Come down here. Um, and so I do have a video um, online uh, on YouTube and I will try to attach that to the chat uh, when I'm finished. One thing that's really helpful is a bupivacaine infusion um, or mepivacaine or something like that. And that's really, really helpful for post-operative pain relief. Um, if you have questions about the doses, uh, send me a note and I can get those for you. But we just inject a volume. In your average Cocker Spaniel, we would inject about two mils of uh, bupivacaine or mepivacaine into the tissues surrounding the ear canal. All right, so coming back over here. Uh, complications that we can see, again, that relates primarily to the anatomy. And the most common complication that you're gonna see is facial nerve palsy. And that relates again to the fact that our facial nerve, so if this is our tympanic bulla sitting here, this is rostral and this is caudal. The stylomastoid foramen is sitting here and the facial nerve comes right out of that stylomastoid foramen. And one of the branches is the palpebral branch, which is responsible for the blink. And so that's why um, when we damage that, we're gonna have facial nerve palsy. 
Facial nerve palsy occurs temporarily in about 60% of dogs and permanently in about 10% of dogs. Um, the other uh, risk we have is recurrent draining tracts. And the reason why that occurs is if we look at our tympanic bulla, um, this is all completely lined with secretory epithelium. And it's really gratifying when we're doing a total ear canal ablation, when we can go in and pull out this entire lining in one fell swoop and, um, and get rid of the whole thing. It almost looks like a grape peel. But um, unfortunately, when ha what happens is that it comes out in pieces. And then if you leave even the smallest little fragment of um, secretory tissue in the tympanic bulla, uh, you can develop the draining tract because the secretory material, the fluid that's being produced has to find its way out somehow. And what happens is that either you'll get a draining tract in the skin or you'll get a really painful swelling. We usually do a CT scan on these guys uh, with contrast and we can, uh, in, uh, in those situations, we can uh, often find that little bit of secretory material. Remember that when we're doing a, a total ear canal ablation, not only are we removing the entire ear canal, okay, we're also removing the ventral kind of 50% of the tympanic bulla. And by removing that, um, that's what really uh, uh, makes it easy to get rid of all that secretory material. So when I do a total ear canal ablation, I'm looking at white glistening bone entirely around the, um, the bit of bulla or the, the section of bulla that I've left behind. So that's absolutely critical that you can see, um, you can see white glistening bone. Now, once we've done our bulla osteotomy, and we're looking down into the bulla, you can see our ridge, which is kind of this, the, the ridge between the dorsal lateral and ventral medial compartments of the, of the tympanic bulla. Our facial nerve has come out back here somewhere. The branch of the internal carotid artery is up here. Again, this is rostral and this is caudal. Uh, our vestibular apparatus is gonna be sitting up here in a recess dorsally. And so whenever we're doing um, bull osteotomies, we want to make sure that we stay away from that dorsal section of the tympanic bulla because that's when you're going to get vestibular signs. And when they do have vestibular signs after surgery, they're really, really feeling awful. They've got a really bad head tilt um, and, uh, and they're pretty miserable after the surgery. So I'm really, really cognizant of that. So the structures again at risk that I'm really concerned about are uh, the vestibular apparatus dorsally, the internal carotid artery rostrally and the facial nerve caudally. So um, vestibular signs, um, and these dogs can have a head tilt for years and even for the rest of their lives after surgery. So if you do damage the vestibular apparatus in these patients, you're gonna feel really badly about it for the, you know, the next several years every time this patient comes in to visit and um, they look like they're pretty miserable. So again, totally avoid that dorsal region of the tympanic bullet. Um, now, the other um, um, thing that we can see is incisional infections, and this is not an infection from a, um, uh, a total ear canal ablation, but I have seen them look not indifferent to this. Um, this patient had avulsion of the entire ear. It's a fighting pit bull, which is obviously a horrible thing, um, but it, uh, it came in for avulsion of the entire ear canal, and all that's left down there is a little opening to the... Um, uh, to the horizontal ear canal, and and this dog ended up having not a total ear canal ablation. We were able to reattach that little bit of ear canal to the skin. Uh, Horner syndrome is common, more common in cats, and again with Horner syndrome, we're going to see ptosis, meiosis, and then ophthalmos, and that's due to damage to the sympathetic trunk. Um, and then the other possibility is hemorrhage, and the hemorrhage can occur as a result of damage to that internal carotid artery. So coming back up here, um, I am gonna go and review the anatomy again um, because the anatomy is so important whenever you're working anywhere around the face. And so we'll just go back and review that again. So uh, we have the external ear canal sitting here. We have the eye sitting here. The pinna is up here. We have the vertical ear canal coming into the horizontal ear canal. We have the tympanic membrane 
We have the tympanic bulla sitting here. Coming out of the stylomastoid foramen is the facial nerve. One branch is coming up and innervating the palpebral uh, or becoming the uh, palpebral nerve, which is going to cause uh, the blink reflex. We have the internal carotid artery sitting here. And uh, then we have the vestibular apparatus sitting up here dorsally. Uh, extending our anatomy out a little bit further, we have the jugular vein branching into the lingual facial and the maxillary veins here. And then in the bifurcation of the jugular vein, we have the mandibular salivary gland and then the sublingual gland, which is going to go obviously underneath the tongue. And then sitting on top of that, we're going to have the digastricus muscle. And so you have to pass the um, salivary gland. When you're doing a salivary gland extirpation, you have to pass it underneath the digastricus muscle in order to achieve your rostral extent of your dissection. So I'm going to go to the chat for a minute. I am going to try to find that a link to that video um, uh, of the uh, total uh, ear canal ablation. Uh, please, if you have any questions, feel free to post them um, right now. Otherwise, we'll see you hopefully in the next few days with another uh, informative lecture. Thank you.